Okay, so we're recording. Um, I just, for those who don't know, I'm Dennis Gilmore. I'm the head of the release engineering in Fedora. And today's talk, I'm just going to go over what you need to do when you want to get something new into Fedora and have it be part of Fedora. So I start with saying, what is a new thing? It's not a new spin. It's not um, you know, new RPMs. It's not. It's something that we don't do today. So I'm talking about like if we wanted to do something like say build Ruby gems or and ship a repo of Ruby gems or build Node.js or you know some new container form that comes along, that kind of thing. Um, something that's completely new. You know, modularity is something that's new that's being worked on at the moment. Um, so talking about that kind of stuff, not, hey, I want to get this new spin in. We have a process for that. It's pretty well done. So what could be anything? What I just want to have here. It could be Node.js. could be Ruby Games. could be new containers. could be, you know, I mean, it could be anything. Like, you know, someone could come up with a whole new, Installation, way, you know, like a way to run, not Anaconda, but do installs via something other than Anaconda. It's a new, you know, but, you know, the possibilities are endless as far as what is a new thing. So if you have a new thing, what do you do? You want to talk to a release engineer, and you want to talk to a release engineer really early. I'm going to go over why that is. But that's probably one of the most critical things that you need to do is engage with release engineering really early in the process. And the more invasive and the more new and the more different it is, the earlier you want to engage in release engineering. If you turn around and you like write a whole bunch of tooling and a whole bunch of stuff and say, here's my thing, use it, and we have zero way to actually integrate it into our release process, we're gonna have problems and we're going to clash and it's going to take two or three times longer to get it into Fedora than it would if you, you know, engage with us early. Um, you also need to be open, transparent, work with everyone, not just not just yourself. You know, I, I, people have a tendency to want to do a thing and be like, hey, look, I made this thing that's awesome and shiny and new and wonderful. And everyone kind of goes, whoa. It, I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't do the bulk of your work by yourself or, um, you know, do it. I mean, you could sit in your office, work for, you know, three months and then come out and go, here's the thing. You can do that, but it's better if you do it open. One of our requirements is that we have to have everything open in Fedora. If you want to build it, it has to be you know, done using open tools. Years ago, Coventry offered to do free scans of all the code in Fedora, and we had to say no because it's a proprietary solution. So anything you do has got to be open. And you need to not rely on others to do your work. So historically, when people have come up with new things, they're like, release engineering, go make this happen. And release engineering has very limited resources for doing new things. We're you know, really busy people. Um, so you can't rely on us to do all of the work for you. So you need to be in the open. You need to work in the open. You need to be transparent. Um, everything has to be open source. You know, as it, today, it's a little tricky to do. You, know, you, you can do pieces of Fedora, but it's a little tricky to do all of the compose process in Fedora, but we want it to be so that it's completely open and you want to make an install DVD at home, you should be able to. You want to do a compose of Fedora, you should be able to. There's no reason why. Um, the main issue at the moment is that the testing is not, we don't test overly well um, doing it outside of the Fedora environment and some pieces of it rely heavily on running things on the specific architectures. So they, we do that via Koji, and we kind of lock down who can do that because it has full read-write access to map Koji. Um, so it makes it a little tricky. Fedora is an integrated thing. Um, we, you know, 
when we build Fedora, we, we build the Compose, we have this integrated process we run. And it outputs a massive, massive number of things. We have something like 20 different live CDs. We have four different cloud images. We have one, one set of installed DVD, but we have four installed trees. We have like 20, nearly 20,000 source RPMs and something like 65 or 70,000 binary RPMs that make up Fedora. It's a massive thing. And if we end up trying to run a process that is on the side and is not integrated into how we make Fedora, that means we then have to run things multiple times. So we, you know, we have to go, we run Fedora and then we've got to run this other thing and then something else comes along and we've got to run this other thing. It's, it just doesn't scale very well. So our, the way we scale how we can deliver more in Fedora is we have it tightly coupled and integrated. Uh, ideally, longer term, we're looking at some automation so that we can perhaps decouple some of the pieces of Fedora and deliver them separately. We've kind of started that with the two-week, but it's a the two-week atomic compose. It's a it's a composer Fedora. It's just a subset of the bits that are inside of Fedora. Um, so you know we 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 need to integrate in with the Fedora processes. We you know if we ended up with a hundred things that we need to run, it, you know, we don't we don't have the people to do that. So we also have PDC in Fedora, which is new in Fedora 24, and it's supposed to be the source of all knowledge in, in what is in a compose in a release. You should be able to go to it and say, hey, there was, you know, what was in Fedora 24, and you get the list of all the ISOs, all the installers, you know, all, all the stuff that goes in there. So if we have something not integrated that makes it more difficult to integrate in PDC. You need to be able to reproduce. And what that means is um, we need to know like the inputs that went in, we need to know the build environment or compose environment. We need to be able to you know, reproduce the deliverable at any point in time. So if we say, you know, in the, in the case of install media, we know the environment that install media is made in, we know the RPMs that went into it, we have the, you know, the logs of everything. So reproducibility is vital for a number of reasons, the main one being that we have an insurance, if we can reproduce something, we have an insurance that we actually know what went into it. We know how it was made and we know, you know all, all the pieces about it so that you know, we, we can redo it. And that gives us a level, particularly from a security point of view, and if the Fedora is less important, but also certifications and stuff like that. If you get FIP certification or you know, the different government certifications to be able to run the operating system in you know, Department of Defenses and you know, different government industries, different government departments require you know, certifications. Fedora is less important, you know, RHEL is much more important. Everything needs to be audible. It kind of ties into reproducibility. We need to know what went into it, what we got out of it, the you know, process you know, front to back, so that if somebody comes along and says, hey, I think that your you know, Fedora installer DVD is being tainted and it's installing malware, we can go back and look and go, no, we put this in, we went through this, we got this out, and it's not tainted, and you know, ideally we can reproduce it 100% and we can go, look, we've remade it and this matches that. There's no way that that thing is tainted or, you know, installing malware or, I mean, yeah. So audibility, it also en enables accountability. So that, that comes back to, you know, RPM builds, etc. we have the audibility of, we know where the sources are, you know, we've got look inside cache, we've got disk here. It ensures that the package maintainer is accountable for what went into it. You know, if we end up finding that somebody put patented code, or they put, um, you know, bad software, or you know, the upstream got hacked and their their table was compromised, and the maintainer put it in, we can go, okay, you know, Joe put this in on this day, and so with the audibility of all of the inputs and all of the outputs, 
you know, we know who did it. We can, you know, uh, talk to them if somebody does something wrong, you know, you know, rather than try and scratch our heads and figure out, you know, who it is. We can very easily go and get that. So anything that you want to do in Fedora that's new, we need to ensure that we have that full audibility. Um, you know, let us know what we shipped and how, because, you know, if we... You know, if someone looked at the updates RPM repo and said, hey, where did this RPM come from? And we have no idea. That's great cause for concern that somebody's done something that they shouldn't have. Oh my. What we ship needs to be definable. Um, what that means is, you know, like in the, in the Fedora the compose process, we have config files that define what we what we ship in the Fedora. In the RPM case, we have spec files that define how the spec file happens. In layered images, we have the Docker files that define you know what goes into it, what comes out of it. Uh, so every, everything that we do, we can't rely on some kind of magic to you know we, we do this thing and it goes off and it does stuff and we get this out. We need to know exactly what we're putting in, exactly what we're getting out, what we expect to have, what we expect to ship. Um, it's pretty critical that we, you know, that we have that. Um, you know, Fesco, QA, and Ryan will need to know what's being done. And that's purely because... Um, you know, if, if QA doesn't know what they need to test, what, you know, how can we be sure of what we're going to ship? If Berlin doesn't know what they need to build uh, and compose, you know, we, we can't be sure of what we're going to ship. Um, you know, Fesco, as the technical arbitrator, it needs to know what's being done. So, you know, if you can't, if you want something to be part of Fedora, you can't just go off on the side and say, hey, you know what, I made this thing over here and I did some stuff and here, you know, I've got this whole new magic, you know, food thing, and expect to have it called, you know, Fedora, because with the Fedora name, at least we hope, there is some level of trust that, you know, it's a known quantity, it's verifiable, it's, you know, you, you're not going to, you know, like if, if it was a free fall, you, you wouldn't know whether, you know, is this thing good or bad, which is kind of, you know, some of the complaints of things like the Docker Hub or, you know, like in the, you know, someone was talking about, like in the pip repo, I think they had some issues recently. Um, yeah, NPM also. And NPM had, had issues where, you know, malicious code got in there, and, you know, we, we want, anything that we do in it all, we want to be able to say for sure, like if it says, this is Fedora that you know, people are going to trust that it is what we say it is. And so it needs to be defined. It needs to be deliverable. And by deliverable, we have quite a few things that we need to have happen. And so with anything new, there's really no set you know, there's not a set formula that says, you know, for Fedora we want, you know, you have to meet this exact template because, you know, what, what's deliverable? Live CD, it just needs to be out on a mirror somewhere where the download leaks can redirect to it. But with something like, say, OS Tree, deliverable is a very different thing. You need to, I mean, today, I'm going to pick on OS3 for a little bit because it was one of the m more recent things that were added and Ian's here who's now responsible for managing it to an extent. Yeah. Um, so today OS3 doesn't know how to talk to mirrors. It doesn't know how, or it doesn't know how to use mirrors. It doesn't talk to mirror manager. A lot of, there's a lot of the newer technologies and one of the issues that we're getting that we need to solve with the light images is how do we redirect users to mirrors to get the content. We've got this mirror network that has 
it is from some of the years, but it, the, the nearer servers have gotten more powerful, their bandwidth has gotten bigger, they're able to deliver you know, more stuff for us, the storage has gotten bigger for them. You know, years ago we used to say that we wouldn't go over a terabyte to Bob Fedora. It's probably been two years since we're under a terabyte to Bob Fedora. And that's just with, you know, like at the moment there's Fedora 22, 23, 24, and Rawhide on that mirror, and we're using a on, in Pub Fedora. We're putting some stuff in um, Pub Old, uh, but with what we're putting on Pub Fedora, we're sitting at about 1.4, 1.5 terabytes of disk. You know, the, 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 the massive amount of scale of what we have in Fedora is huge. Um, if we had to serve everything from one point, that point would just be a complete bottleneck and choke and you know, people wouldn't be able to get Fedora. But in the saying that back to the OS2 case, it doesn't know how to use mirrors, so every single user that is using OS2 on Atomic as shipped by Fedora is pointed to a single location to download all of their updates from. At the moment, it's not a big deal because there's not a massive amount of users, and likely any largest deployment is you know, either building their own OS trees or they're um, building, you know, they're, they're mirroring the OS tree internally and they're pointing all of their clients at their own mirror of it as opposed to having all their clients pull from, you know, Fedora itself. Um, but, you know, not being able to use mirror manager, not being able to redirect downloads to different download servers hurts the ability to be able to grow. So if you wanted to do something like, um, yeah, so say we want to turn around tomorrow and start working on producing our own Fedora Node.js repo that has you know, all, all these NPM packages so that people doing Node stuff can work in the way that they're used to working, but they can pull stuff from Fedora knowing that it's been vetted, it's been built in a you know, controlled, audible way, the content that goes in there is verifiable, and all, you know, all the guarantees that we give as being part of Fedora. You know, if we wanted to do that, we wouldn't want to have a single, you know, to have everything run just in Phoenix, which has a issue of not having IPv6, but has the other issue that everyone's pulling from the one location. So we need to have some kind of mirror integration into, you know, the, the NPM command, and so that, you know, we can point it at our mirror list and, you know, redirect people to different mirrors that are close to them yeah, get, hopefully getting faster delivery. Yes, yeah. Well, since you call it up, this is a good thing. <coughs> if I have a cool new thing that I think might get great adoption, yep. do I need to boil the ocean and sort out how to do mirroring and how to do using things first? Or can I do what we've done with Atomic, which is make the best effort and get it deliverable, and then say, we should be so lucky as to have a problem that our cool new thing is so popular that we actually are struggling to do what we're sure. to So, I think that for something new, we probably don't have to have the mirror integration on day one. Yeah, the, 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 pro the process is an evolving process. But what we need to do is we need to have the plan that this is how it's going to work. You have to have an eye toward yeah. the scale. Right. I mean, and, and, and like I was saying before, there's nothing that's set in concrete because, and there's no set template. It, it really is specifically depending on what it is you want to deliver. You know, if, if all we're doing is coming up with a new, you know, say, container format that can just be point, you know, we, we create this container, we put it on the mirror, and you just, you know, like the user essentially W gets it, then, you know, we could take advantage of, to an extent, we can take advantage of just using mirror managers redirects. Or, you know, in the case of the way it images, we likely need to have some mirror manager integration. So, you know, how we deliver stuff really depends on what it is, how users interact with it, how users fetch it. You know, like in the case of, like, the live CDs, it doesn't need any mirror manager, real mirror manager integration. We don't need meta links and mirror lists and 
things like that because you get it once and you know the user's manually getting it. So you don't need to have you know, like if the download fails, the user can try again and you know, hopefully get a different mirror that has it or can redirect it somewhere else. But it's a user-driven thing where when you're dealing with tooling, particularly where you want to do, potentially fail over to, you know, multiple mirrors so that, you know, if I request this thing from mirror A and it doesn't have it, well, I go to mirror B and mirror C until I get to a mirror that has, you know, the content that I want to have. Um, in, you know, in the case of modules coming up, we're going to have to look at how, um, you know, how, how the mirroring of that's going to work and how the mirror manager integration of that's going to be. It's not something that I think anyone's looked at yet, but we've also not looked at exactly how we're going to deliver that to and use this completely. At the moment, everyone's focused on building the model as opposed to you know, how do we get that to people and how do we enable people to select, you know, the interface to select that. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's be deliverable. You, you can't rely on a CDN, which a lot of the new technology seems to be wrapped around. Fedora doesn't have a CDN, and Fedora doesn't have the budget for a CDN. We have a CDN that has been donated to us, but I've heard from some other open source communities that that particular CDN, if you send too much traffic to them, they will eject and kick you off. So we can't really, we can use it for some small things, but we can't. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the critical things, the mirror manager, and how we're going to take advantage of that, so it, it's a lot of working with people. The, as much as the technology side of how you build it, how do you ship it, is, is important, the political side of working with people to ensure that we, you know, everyone's on board, everyone knows what's needed, is also, you know, a critical step. Um, so, quick summary, you need to talk, you need to communicate, you need to be open and transparent, and you need to work with us. They're all essentially the same thing. And it's probably the most critical thing in getting something new into Fedora. I mean, Matthew Miller's talk started a thread on the legal list a couple of weeks ago. He wanted to have a new trademark to enable people to be able to build things and ship them themselves and I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions around that and I'm not opposed to that but I want to make sure that if we go that route where we you know have a have a have a main space where people can build things from Fedora and ship it that is not something that we do today that we ensure that the way that they do it is, is done with all of these things in mind, so that if it becomes successful and people want to, you know, then integrate that into Fedora, we don't get to the case of, I'm going to pick on Atomic again, where, you know, Colin wrote this thing called RPM Tree Toolbox, which does all sorts of composing and all sorts of pieces, and it's a great end user tool, but it's not a great tool to integrate within you know, the process of how we, you know, compose Fedora as a whole. And so, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's been very difficult to get Atomic into Fedora, and that was the main thing that drove me to decide to submit this talk on, you know, getting things into Fedora. Because the only guarantee I think we have at the moment is that there's going to be more new things. You know, blade images are coming that coming out. Um, there's, you know, I would like to see us actually do like Node.js, Ruby Gem, you know, PyPy type repos of all the different stacks. A big part because while I'm a big fan of RPMs and what it gives us, if you do a new install of Fedora today and you want to say, you know, as soon as you've done the install, you go, 
you know, DMF install um, IRSSI. The first thing it does is downloads 42 meg of metadata for the RPMs. It's huge, particularly given that you know, IRSSI is a 200, 300k application. And you're downloading a massive amount of data to get this small little thing. And you know, the, the metadata for the repo, you know, for the federal repo is huge and it's getting bigger all the time. If you look at the stats, I'll quickly go there. Um, let me, I have to join the network. Um, if you look at the stats of Fedora, um, Click on the steps here for uh, um, package PV. Uh, okay. So this is the evolution of packages in Fedora under the releases. Fedora 1, 2, and 3, well, up to 6. That is just what was in Fedora Extras. It doesn't include the core. Seven is where core and extras merged, and you can see it wasn't really that big a jump. Core was a lot smaller than extras at that point in time, but you know, at that point we had just under 5,000 packages in Fedora 7. This is source RPMs, right? This is source RPMs. This is just the number of source packages that make up Fedora. And you see the progression, and because everyone likes putting all the packages in all of the latest releases of Fedora, there's really not a big difference between 23, 24, 25, and 26 at this point in time. But it's just under 20,000 source packages in Fedora at the moment. So, you know, 22 is starting to drop down below that because it's end of life, but it, at the end of its life, it had, you know, almost, it was about 18,500, I think, Soft packages were in Fedora 22 at the end of its life. And, you know, we've had this very large... Excuse me, I can this thing more quickly. Uh, you know, 17,725. Uh, yeah. So, we'll have today 18,257 packages. And it fluctuates a bit when we, you know, fill up a whole bunch of packages that are, you know, orphan for a while, numbers drop down, and they <coughs> start adding things back, and it picks back up. Um, but, you know, it had a steady increase. I think it's only going to get bigger, so modularity, I think, will help in making, like, the metadata smaller. I would really love to have this not deliver um, so much as far as updates go. So I'd like to get us to a point where more high or something like more high is where developers use and uh, power users live, and it's a stable you know, environment where people can be pretty sure that you know, stuff doesn't break. A lot of the guarantees that you kind of get by using, say, Fedora 24 at, you know, today. Um, but so. Yeah. Yeah, the, there's a met, the, the metadata around it is really big, so I'd like to make it smaller. The, the, you know, the cranky system in, they like things in RPMs. So I'd like to you know, like do things in a way where you know, we could have a Node.js RPM repo, we have a Node.js you know, NPM repo in Fedora, and so the developer can develop in the way they like, the cranky sysadmin can deploy in the way he likes, 
they get in the exact same thing. You know, they could build, it, build natively as Node.js or Ruby Gems or you know, Python you know, packages. We wrap up the end result into an RPM as well as into the native format, you know, enabling people to work in the way that they want to work while giving them the guarantees and assurances of, you know, that, you know, Fedora, something being Fedora gives. Um, but, you know, that all takes people that want to do it, you know, people are able to do it, the time to do it, you know, to, you know, Release engineering historically has been way, way under resourced. We're better than we were, but we still don't have the resources to do anything, everything we want to do. So having you know people and having people work with us and you know us saying we're going to talk to you, we're going to work with you, and enable you to do the thing you want to do in a way that when you're done, we're going to be able to incorporate and add into Fedora um, is, you know, the end goal. Go back. So does anyone have any questions? It kind of partially fits into modularity, but like in the instance of say a Ruby gem, say we've got Ruby gems and we make a native, you know, Ruby gem repo so you can type Ruby gem install you know, foo and it's going to get food from the store Ruby gem repo and install it. As a developer, that makes it easy for you to develop your code, and then you know we. Assuming that we have everything from that, you know, the developer can do like Ruby gem list or whatever. I'm, I don't actually use, I use RPMs myself, but I know that there's a lot of developers like to work in the native, you know, format. But, you know, there would be some method to list and say, this is what I have in my dev environment. They can give that list to the, um, you know, the system then, and then there'll be a matching RPM repo where system Mink can then install the matching RPMs of that. I kind of imagine that what it would actually be is we have a, you know, like we'll have a repo to say Python 2.7, maybe a repo for Python 2.6, uh, you know, one for Python 3.4, maybe one for 3.3, and it will be a you know, a, a repo that's just for the Python release. So if we have three versions of Python, uh, three versions of Fedora that have Python, you know, 7 which I think we've got more than that at the moment in Fedora, let's say there's, you know, three or four versions of Fedora, you can then enable that repo on any of those releases of Fedora and you get the same bit. It's not necessarily tied to the release so much as tied to the upstream version of the, you know, the major component like Python or Ruby. Does that answer your question? They're just kind of speculation examples. Yeah. There's not really anyone working on them. It's, I just I think it would be kind of neat to have to where we can divide it up and if you're going to use that thing, you can enable it and get the metadata, but we can then perhaps take you know, a bunch of the Python stuff out of, and Python's probably a bad example, but the Ruby stuff we can take out of Fedora and make the base Fedora and metadata smaller because if you want it, you need to enable this Fedora you know, Ruby repo. Yeah. I'm not. No. No. Uh, 
So the, the question, just to kind of do it for the recording, was if the new trademark is for a new repository that people can build their stuff and ship it, or like a proper type thing. Yeah. It, it, it's um, more for having a way for people to build things, like, say, build, I guess, I'm going to pick on OS3 again, you know. Build, build OS tree and ship it and say it's enabled from, it, it's built from components of the Infidora itself, but it's not actually a part of, it's not like an official Fedora deliverable, it's not part of what we define as this is Fedora, it's something that's built from Fedora components, but it's built by somebody else and it's not a official part of Fedora. That's all it is. I'm going to put together a counter presentation of how not to <laughs> and maybe that'll highlight a little bit more. But I did I think you hit on one of the biggest problems very early on when you said getting something into Google uh, ultimately means integrating it into a composed process that is not well understood by a large number of people sure. and is very difficult to run outside of the Google infrastructure. I, I and I say this as someone who tried to do it, right? And I, I had a few advantages being able to do it on a virtual machine in the same data center. Yeah where the infrastructure is, is still very large. So yeah. um, making that integration point more explicit rather than, say, rather than sort of having to iterate through. I almost would compare it to, and I know this is not a question, this is a diatribe, but, you know, you, we were talking about this. is fine. Yeah. That you are, you know, if you use a factory now, you have a big assembly line that can churn this out yeah. at a massive scale. And you have a lot of people doing interesting new things in their garages. Mm -hmm. And we have to jump right from that to integrating it on the factory floor, which is yeah. like, you know, it's very difficult. I, I think part of it is we maybe need to work on, like, punting the compose tools and provide an easier way for you to plug in new functionality. Like, we kind of need to have the same need in code. We need an easier way to plug new functionality into code. Ideally, anything that, ideally, all the pieces of a compose can be run locally on the machine, you can do it all yourself, but we also want to do it in Koji so that we have this central point where you want to see what was the latest, you know, version, what, what, what's the latest branch, you know, workstation ISO, or the latest branch, um, you know, cloud images, or Docker base image, or whatever. You go to Koji and you can find that. We want to have that for all the different pieces that we deliver. But we also want to make sure that you at home can, you know, go off and make your own install media to do something custom you want to do. Or, you know, be able to do every, you know, do everything that we do to make it all Okay, it's fine. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I think another good example, I guess, to, to back on to the other two, the thing that um, I is Docker. I mean, if you're doing Docker layered images has also um, been interesting. It's been an interesting journey to go from the build tooling that is presented by the upstream project, which is basically meant to run a developer laptop, and turning it into um, something that we can, we can actually use to produce the work. Um, and then uh, the, the side piece of that is the distribution, the redistributable uh, component of it, to be able to actually ship it. Um, the whole different pile of design problems and, and the other. Uh, yeah, I mean, so it, it's, it's one of those things where um, I, I agree, I agree with those uh, three in the sense that uh, it can be painful, but I think a lot of it is just like the side effect of going from the, the just to use even talent, going from the garage to the manufacturer, from, yeah, bench, I mean, from bench scale to... Right, and, and I, I, think, I think we're going to deal with that with all of the new things, uh, it, it's, it's not even like it's not necessarily like a, a negative, um, like a negative comment. It's just the reality of well, right. you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, 
we're not we're, we're really not in the business of saying you have to do it any particular way. I mean, I push back on some of the stuff in the OSP because one, it is Docker, which we don't use Docker in well edge today. And it's not that it used Docker, it was that I, I wasn't able to see the log information on what went into the Docker containers, what went into that environment. And so long as we can get what we, you know, we can get that logging and that loadability out of it, then I think it's okay. But we need to be sure that we're going to get the loadability and to get those things out. You make extensive use of containers in the most part. We do. You just but call we them do. We call not true. Right. But you so we, we, we use a containerized environment a lot, but it's not. And it's well understood. We get the it's well, any, any more people understand Docker than, than will ever understand Monster. Do they know? Uh, yeah. In terms of how to create the Docker and yeah. review. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, well, so, so, I mean, the market, market easily gives us the RPMs that went in. And yeah. at least yeah. as far as I could see on the OX3 yeah. side, yeah. we weren't getting that list of RPMs that went into the container. Yeah. So we didn't know what went in there. Um, <laughs> so, it, we're, we're not going to turn around and say you have to use X technology, but if, if, if you come to us and say, we've got this thing and it does this, and, we'll, and yeah, it, yeah. I mean, and historically we've perhaps been a little more stubborn than we could have been, in part because, you know, 18 months, two years ago, that was with me. And we now have about eight, nine people working on it but we're still struggling to keep up with everything that would be not us. That's been our stuff. That's been what we want. And then what we make up for and stuff. Oh, yeah, but something, some, something has to do. Yeah. 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 So how often do you talk to upstream, uh, or upstream developers of tools you are using, like DNS or RPM or RPM? Um, DNS and RPM probably not as much as we should. The tooling, like, you know, Google Server is the upstream of Pandi, and I talk to him almost every day. Um, and well, depending on the tooling, Lorex and then the other guys, we talk to them probably at least once or twice a week on IRC, other different things. It really depends. Like, I mean, if we, if we get a bug and we need a resolution, then we're going to talk to them and engage with them and get stuff fixed. But, you know, like on an ongoing basis, there's probably not really enough communication. And I think that that's true of Fedora as a whole, the communication between all the different parts. And it's really hard because Fedora is a really big project that delivers a lot of different things and scratches a lot of different things. Yeah, it's just for different people. Uh, so when you talk about features, we would make sure a lot easier, like we try to make them pilot that to work. So we, uh, in the last 12 months or so, we have been trying to engage more in doing that. Um, it could be done better. <laughs> you know, it, it can always be done better. point, though, is we, now we're trying to better, we have that better. We're, we've done better than well, we also did that. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> this this whole yeah. talk was about toilet for the authors. Yeah, but so many directions. It really is. I mean, the whole point was down to I could have given the talk in five minutes. <laughs> you want to do something? Talk with all the people involved. <laughs> so um, our time is up. So thank you very much, everyone.